Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Show with your host, Jeff Lopes, where we bring you the world's top athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, influencers, and their journeys to success. We are live. We are live on the Jeff Nosing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today, Brad Montague. What is up, brother? Hello to me. <laughs> this, this, this is going to be a fun conversation today. Brad has obviously New York Times top seller. He's the gentleman behind the kid. Is it the kid president? That's it? Yes. And, and there's, a, there's a, a tons of stuff. So I, I always like starting off where learning as much as I can about you, your upbringing, what got you to this path? And then we kind of just take the story from there. So you grew up in Tennessee. How was your childhood and, and how did it all, where did you love for writing creativity? Where did that all start? Well, I, I, um, I remember one point when I was a kid, I grew up in a small town in Tennessee. Uh, and um, I remember there was a time I was staring out the window of my room and I remember my parents were, I had probably been there for who knows, maybe an hour, just staring out the window. And I remember <laughs> the, the concern on my parents' face. <laughs> when they're like, um, like tentatively asking at the door, uh, is, is he okay, Brad? Are you okay? <laughs> and I was like, what's, what, what? I was just, yeah, I had a whole world happening in my head. And, uh, uh, only later realized, oh, they, they had reason to be concerned. <laughs> oh, no, he's creative. Oh, no. Um, as I grew up on a farm and, you know, uh, it, it's, um, there's a creativity to that for sure. But um, it's a little more uh, hard labor um, of, of a lifestyle. Uh, we raised pigs, grew cotton, soybeans, had a large garden as well. Uh, so I always I love nature. Um, but um, but writing is primarily an inside task, Wait, inside what? your heart, and also indoors. Good when, good lighting. When, when did you start like really taking pen to paper and start writing? And 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 how did it start off? Did it start off more poems? Did it start off trying to like where did that creativity start aspect of it of the writing start? Uh, it's something I've always done. I would finish my tests early as a kid so that I could just draw on the backs of them. So doodle. <laughs> so doodle. Yeah, I had a fourth grade teacher who finally realized what I was doing and then said, hey, you know, I'll give you paper. You don't have to rush through your test. You do your work and I'll give you paper. You don't have to finish your test early so you can draw on the back. Um, but it was never something I took seriously. It's just something that... Um, came freely and i thought oh everything else i do i've got to find like a real job i've got to i've got to do something else and um and so i chased um uh, i loved cameras and working uh in video i made a lot of home movies as a kid um and so then i thought well you know i guess what i'm supposed to do is just work in news is that that seemed like you know Media, okay yeah. I could do that that's creative enough and respectable uh and attainable there's you know there's, there's news stations all over the country I could do that uh so I worked in news for a bit and quickly learned I don't want to do that <laughs> as you do right yeah um, because with that I found oh I love telling stories I love meeting with people I love um, getting out there and, and finding beauty and getting a great shot. And then you come back in the edit and you start to like put it together. And back then I was um, editing on reel to reel. Like there was a station that had not moved to digital editing yet. Yeah. So I was learning to edit that way. And then I had to learn digital. And then you get in the edit and you realize, oh no, I am telling the story of somebody's worst day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very like, true. It's very true. Like this you, don't, is, you don't think about it that way, but it's true. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's nice stories you tell as well, but yeah, very true. There's lots of other stories I could have told, but the stories were assigned to us. And yeah. you're like, oh, there's a car accident here just, you know, down from the studio. Go go get that. Oh, somebody messed up. Let's go tell the story of the fallout from that. Oh, the, you know, over and over, I realized 
I'm telling stories of the worst day in somebody's life. And I'm focused on getting the best shot, not on being comfort or bringing hope. And I began to really have a longing to tell better stories. (laughs) And I I didn't know what they were, but I suddenly knew what they weren't and um, that there was another story to tell. And uh, so I began kind of chasing after that. And um, as part of that, one of the things I started to recognize was that a story I wanted to hear was the world from more of a child's perspective. So how do they see the world? Um, There's a different way of seeing hope and seeing possibility. Um, And, and I was longing for that. So created that. What I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to go back to one quick question. I just have in my head, you always hear, and, and I was very much like that. I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for 26 plus years. You always hear going through school, um, children that are very creative or very, um, they have a hard time really caring or focusing on their education because they have so much other energy built towards creating other things. Were you, did you fit in that category? Were you always like, like I was in school, like I, I, I couldn't wait to finish school. I couldn't wait to get out of high school. I couldn't, because I, I felt like I had so much more to do. Did you go through that, any of that growing up? Yeah, I felt like uh, something's very wrong with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something is very wrong with me, but I'm also a pleaser. So I wanted to do well. I wanted to do well in school, but I was really, really wanting to yeah. share with them the poetry I'd written about cats. <laughs> I was really more interested in these doodles <laughs> about birds or these things that were fast, these worlds I was creating in my head um, or events I was wanting to create or, or these different things I was wanting to bring into the world yeah. and yet feeling like, Oh, but that's, that's a little too weird. Or that's not what they want. Um, let me do the homework. That's assigned. Yeah, and so- then everything else will be icing on the cake yeah. and I'll hide that icing. And it's yeah. just for me and my friends. And yeah. I, I began to learn that that's the good stuff. That's the stuff worth sharing. That's the stuff the world needs. And so I, um, I'm definitely, uh, I have radar now for those kids and former kids yeah. who uh, feel a little bit on the outside, who yeah. feel uh, maybe they're the misfit toys, the island of misfit toys <laughs> looking uh, Rudolph. Yeah. Uh, those are the most interesting toys. Yeah, yeah, no, 100% sure, 100% sure. So when you had that mindset of seeing the world through a lens of a child or or just their expression, was there something, a moment that just triggered that thought or was there, it was that just a creative over the years of your childhood wanting to express how you felt like wh- wh- what changed? Did you, is there a child you saw and you like, you saw something they did? Like, was there a moment that just clicked for that idea? It's, it's always been something that I've been drawn to and interested to in yeah. um, like, cause I, I think back to all the things that resonated with me. Yeah. were all things that had real children's voices included, including like the original peanut specials. Yeah, they yeah, had yeah. awkward young kids' yeah. voices doing them. Yeah. You can tell they're not acting. It's just it's just real kids. Reading. I even love uh, classic Sesame Street. The voiceover artist yeah, yeah. was just kids talking about you know going somewhere. You know, it was just real voices of real kids. And they're imperfect and a little messy and a little like Innocent. out of tune. And there's Innocent, something that's yeah. more real about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I even love, uh, that's part of why I, what I loved about, um, I began being drawn to the indie music scene in the nineties, MTV and all that. I was more interested in those bands that were playing out of tune. Those artists that, that were, uh, it captured what it feels like to be a kid or to be just a person. Yeah. It's to have big feelings and not quite a, the ability to express them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just enough to like oh, plan it. It's a little out of key. <laughs> um, Daniel Johnson is a musical artist I love. Uh, uh, someone who had these big worlds and big ideas and yet couldn't fully express them uh, in his music. And, and if you if you're trained to with an ear that's just for things you hear on the radio, you, you miss out on the fact that, Oh, there's something far more beautiful and 
the someone singing raw uh, uh, from their heart, from their imagination. Um, and so I've always been drawn to that. Um, and when I uh, thought back to the things that I needed as a kid, um, a place that was safe for me and a place where I felt like I could be the weird kid that uh, had dreams and could share them around the campfire was, was summer camp. And I've always sure. loved camps. Yeah. Uh, it was a place where, you know, there was just enough structure, but a whole lot of play and, and I felt like I belonged. So my wife and I, we began creating summer camps, like different camp experiences. When, when did this start? How long ago? So that was 12 years ago. Okay. 12, so you've been at it for a while. Okay. Go. Longer. Yeah. And she and I met at summer camp as kids. <laughs> <laughs> how, how ironic, huh? Yeah. We met at camp as kids. Uh, it took a little while for me to convince her that we were more than friends, but we did meet as friends at camp. And then we worked as counselors at a camp and, 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 uh, then got married on the soccer field at camp. That's pretty amazing. How long, how long have you been married for? So 19 years. That is, so you got married probably the same year as me. I've been, I'm, I'm going to 19 years, September 20. Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today. With expert interviews, practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts bravo bravo it just gets better and better and like we started thinking about okay she and i work together a lot um uh and and working together with your spouse can have challenges but for yeah, 100%. us it's, it's been so uh, such a part of who we are just describe uh, describe your wife to me and tell me how what, what, what does she mean to you <laughs> putting on this five. Oh man it's hey, not gonna be this <laughs> uh she's she's everything she she and i are true partners in the sense that um we finish each other's sandwiches all the way. <laughs> she, she is, is all the things I am not, which is many things. Yeah. And um, where I am messy, she is a perfectionist. Where I am a big <laughs> dreamer, she is a clear and precise planner. Um, and where I am a doodler and love to draw, she is the one who f- adds flourishes of color. Uh, and so even the way we, we now collaborate on picture books. And so I do these sketches and, and my sketches are getting a little bit more dynamic and a little more like uh, complex for me. Uh, but for her, <laughs> she, she takes them and then elevates them and adds what I, what I see in my head but can't express with my hands. Uh, and so it, it is a true uh, uh, team in that way. And so we've approached everything that, that way from parenting to, um, our business. How, how many children do you have? I have two, how old? nine year old and a seven year old boys or girls, a boy and a girl. So which is the youngest? Our little girl. Okay. So I'm the opposite. I, I, my, 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 we've been married, both same thing, 19 years. My daughter just turned 16. My son just turned 14. Amazing. Oh, so you're in a totally different, uh, uh, uh path uh totally different uh, uh needs yeah they have it yeah 100 percent. but i i've i've from day one have um built uh, i would say not even a unique relationship but i have a very i'm very present father like i've wrote a book on called entrepreneurial dad like i i'm a very present father i, I make sure that i'm very present i spend a lot of time with them like they're my workout partners like i'm gonna be home yeah, at well. 2 30 3 o'clock today and we go to the gym together we do a lot together and i'm still i try to be still that cool dad that, that even though my daughter is 16 still wants to hang out with wants to do things with um so we've built this really really good relationship 
and and I mean, they're everything to me, right? Everything, everything to me. So um, they're my 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 drive and my passion for everything I do, right? And 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 my wife's just uh, it's just the one that keeps everything anchored together, and which is yeah. so special, right? Anchor the anchor. Yeah, it's sad. So being a dad, I'm just throwing the questions that are popping my head out. Being a dad, what does that mean to you? Being a dad. <laughs> Oh, uh, there, there's always the idea of what you think something's going to be. And then what it actually is, I knew everything there was to know about parenting until I became a parent. Oh yeah. You, you, <laughs> you, 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 you're never prepared. I also thought I knew who I was. I knew everything about me and becoming a father unlocked so much of my uh, childhood yeah. Uh, it brings you back to who you were when you were a child, what yeah. you needed, what it felt like to be vulnerable, what it felt like to need um, someone in your life. And, and you begin to reflect on what you had, what you didn't have, what you want them to have that you had, what you don't want them to have. And it just all that swirls in you and around you. And hopefully you don't uh, run away from those big feelings or challenges that, that pop up in your head, but you, you, like you were talking about being a present yeah. parent, uh, that's been my goal. And, um, and it's, it's the, it's a big goal. And, and um, each day calls for different types of presence. Yet I, I'm trying to, to show up. Yeah, that's all it is. It's showing up and building. I always say showing up and building as many memories as you possibly can, because, life is short. I mean, time flies by and, and, and there's stats out there to say 80%, 80 to 90% of the FaceTime you have with your kids before the age of 18. So I'm looking at my daughter. I'm like, another two years, she's off to college. I'm like, yeah. I, I got to make the most of this. And I, and, and I still look at her and think of when she was three months old, colicky, and we were walking up and down the halls, taking shifts, me and my wife thinking like, what are we doing? So it's like, it's, it's, it's crazy how fast time flies and, and how beautiful life is. But how we're getting older and now that and i'm not sure if you're if, if your parents are still around but i lost i lost my dad 15 months ago and 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 he was hands down my best friend and now i look at my kids and I especially my son i go uh, i'm his best friend like he's I'm, I'm everything to him i'm his hero so i look at that and i'm like my journey is coming now. Like I'm, when I look at my dad, I'm like, now I'm like, I'm next in line. If, if everything goes correctly in, in the path of life. So it's, 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 it's just an eye opener how quickly life is. And you have to build as many memories. Cause that was one thing my dad, I mean, we didn't financially come from a ton, but my dad built as much memories as he could with me. And I, and I, and I talk about those memories all the time. I have those stuck and engraved in my head. I mean, we went for God, 12, 13 years straight, my dad worked at Ford Motors, and I tell the story all the time. Worked at Ford Motors, and what he do is he'd pack all his holidays into one big holiday in the summer for four weeks. He would take off four weeks. We jump in the car from Toronto, Canada, drive up to Cape Cod, rent a little cottage by the beach, and we spend two and a half, three weeks every summer there. And those are the it. those drives and those memories of just being in a little cabin with my family and waking up and going for walks in the they're priceless. And when my kids got old enough, the first thing I did was grab them and go, and we took a road trip to Cape Cod. So it's, it's, it's those memories are, are pricing. You have to keep building. I just, I, my son's a big baseball guy. I'm a big, but we just came this past weekend from Chicago. We were in Chicago to watch the Cubs game. So it's this, you got to build as much memories as you can while they're young. Cause life is short. You don't know what happens. Right. I, lo I love that you keep using the word build. Yeah. I, it's constant. I you're, you're always working it. Like we don't necessarily think about that as far as, in our relationships uh, in the meaning that we have in our lives that, that we're building something and it's such a healthy way to approach it yeah. um, that, you know, you're not done. No, you're, 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 you're even, building. even your, you're, you're, your marriage, you're always constantly working yeah, on. You have to constructing something. And, 100%. and when you see it that way, it, it allows you to give yourself a little um, grace for those yeah. Yeah. times when you, weren't all there or weren't we didn't go the way that you would have hoped or or what, what whatever um 
but I, I think about my own childhood often and, and even school, you know, it's the field trips you remember. Yeah. It's the, those, yeah. those things that, that you go off. And, and, um, and so we've tried to do that in our family, making travel a part of what we do. Yeah, yeah. But I'm also re- realizing, like I did a project where I interviewed third, fourth and fifth graders um, awesome. all over the United States. And uh, my goal was to, in every state, and I wanted to have different uh, learning environments. So I interviewed students who were, uh, you know, in, in um, big schools and public schools and private schools, home schools, uh, an unschool it was this whole like outdoor area uh, that was just lots of different places. And, um, and I asked kids about grownups and what it meant to be a good grown up. How could I be a better grown up? And, um, and it was really fascinating because they all had different language for it or different stories about good grownups, but all of them essentially had to do with somebody who consistently showed up. Yeah. It was not about the big trips. It was not, it was rarely like about, oh, my, like my uncle got me a jet ski or whatever. No. It was, um, no, like, uh, my, my, um, my dad takes us to the park on the, on Saturdays and, and we ride bikes uh, or uh, my mom, we do this every Friday after school, we have a tradition or it was some, some sort of consistent thing yeah. that uh, this person showed up and they could count on them. <laughs> and I, I thought about all the pressure I'd put on myself to be like this epic dad and do these huge birthday parties and do big things. And the, 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 the assignment is not that the assignment is today yeah look look them in the eyes and and be there yeah be present i mean just look at your feet know where you are at all times and i always say too is i i mean i i, I talk to a lot of dads and i always tell them it's especially as a as a busy entrepreneur i mean it's life gets hectic there's there's valleys where there's times when you need to focus on work a little bit more and that's okay but it's that quality time. You can spend half an hour, but if you turn off your phone and be present, that's so much more valuable than three hours checking your phone every two minutes. Yeah. And another thing I always say is when you give a lot of children, when you give them a gift, they don't care about that toy. That toy will play for, they'll play with it for a day or two. It's that in their eyes, that recognition that my parents, they, they recognize my achievement or they're thanking me or they're happy for me or they're, or they're giving me is that, is that present moment of like, wow, they're here they for know me. me. They see, yes, me. it's not yes. the gift. It's that moment. So if you take that mindset and turn around and be like, Hey, Johnny, let's go, let's go to the batting cage. You're Hey, Johnny, let's go for a, let's go for a bike ride. So much more special, so yes. much more special. And one of the things that's been important to my wife and I is you know, we have this little uh, workshop here where where we um, are able to do our work. So we can film things. We have a recording booth. We also um, have an art area and we ship art prints and packages and books and all that sort of thing. And it's we have an area too where the kids can make their stuff <laughs> and a shelf in the store where my son sells books he makes and yeah. maps that he's making. And we have... Uh, uh, this desire that our kids grow up seeing mom and dad do something they love. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it, I'm trying to be careful about complaining about being busy or complaining about the work I'm doing. I want to be honest with them, yeah. but I also want them to know I'm doing what I love, which is so <laughs> and, special. And sometimes I'm pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> and I want them to see that and, and to go through the successes. And, and so like when, um, we had, I had a book come out the week bookstores closed for COVID. Oh. <laughs> it came out the week everything shut down, the week the world shut down. So a book came out and bookstores are closed. And wow. I was so disappointed, you know, of course. And, and that's, there's a million losses that, that, that were, were had. Everybody had something to mourn in that moment. Yeah. But then, you know, flash forward or last year, we had a picture book that became a New York Times bestseller. And we celebrated with our kids. Like they were with us when they got the, when we got the call. And I just, I love that they saw 
us go through that. They saw the struggle. They saw us making the art. They saw the whole process and then got to celebrate the success with us and see the joy. And, um, and uh, I think there's something that that does to a person because I, I grew up watching my dad do what he loves. Yeah. Um, uh, working with dirt, working with plants and seeing them grow. Uh, like I remember he's a big, tough Southern man. And yet I can him relying so much on the rain to come and, and he's done all the work he can do. And he's yeah. just life, at the life, mercy of the life, weather. Life of a farmer, huh? And then when the rain hit and I saw the joy and like these tears of joy come from this big, tough man, I, I saw passion and I saw the art of what he was doing. And, and that seeps into you where you think, I want to live in a way where I, I'm doing something I care about. And, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, regardless of what it is, kids pick up on it. I love that. A hundred percent. hundred percent. I always, I want to, I want to jump into another topic, but I always say, I mean, as a parent, you have to be aware that, I mean, a lot of parents try to mentor their children, but it's the indirect mentoring, which probably counts the most, how you treat others. Do you open doors for others? How do you, how do you, how do you talk to your spouse? How do you, all those things that you don't realize when you're doing at your relaxed state is indirectly mentoring your children. They're seeing that they're mimicking that they're locking that in their memory. So it's very important to be aware of that as a parent, that indirect mentoring at all times. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, uh, Fred Rogers said that um, uh, the best things are, are caught, not taught. hundred hundred percent. And, and it's, it's so true. We, we want to believe these grand lectures we give or whatever are going to be what sticks, but no. it'll be the way that we, yeah. talks about people in traffic <laughs> oh it's true it's true it is so true so true so kid president how did, how did that all start and 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 you are you constantly are you still doing those videos consistently uh no so i'm i'm doing completely new work now perfect and, um and have continued making new things um, yeah i'm aware i saw a whole bunch of your new stuff yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so Kid President was a project that I started uh, um, uh, with my little brother-in-law, uh, mm-hmm. who at the time was nine. Uh, I just packed him up for college yesterday. Um, talking about time flying. I mean, yesterday we were moving boxes <laughs> into a dorm room. And uh, so I'm doing great. No big emotions here. All <laughs> fine. Um, everything's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's wild. Um, because that came at a time where we had been working with kids at, at different camps. Um, we had created a program that was for kids who wanted to change the world. And it was a junior high and high school students who were doing service projects and doing things with their schools and churches uh, to make their communities better. So I'm surrounded by these just beautiful stories of beautiful people doing things for others. And these were kids. <laughs> uh, and, and then I was feeling the tension between what I was seeing happening with kids and their compassion and creativity. And I was seeing with their parents and grandparents and the conversations they were having online and the cynicism. And and I just thought there's a better story to live here. There's a better story to tell here. What if they could just hear from these kids? And I'd made a few videos where it was just, you know, really heart uh heartwarming and and showing what kids were doing to help their neighbors who were homeless or what kids were doing to start a food kitchen actual yeah. teenagers that started a soup kitchen which is pretty amazing um, <laughs> amazing yeah and those you know people would see oh that's nice but they weren't actually listening or hearing yeah. or they would sort of see the few seconds and go okay i get where he's going with this yeah. And C.S. Lewis talked about that you have to get past people's watchful dragons. That <laughs> everybody has these watchful dragons. Like, hey, wait a minute, are you trying to teach me something? Yeah. Uh, and a way to sneak past that is through humor and <laughs> is through yeah. playfulness. 
Yeah. And um, I thought, well, what if there's a video series where you listen, there's just you listen to a kid and, and he's pretending to be president. And um, I mean, that's the that's the hook there. Right. The, I mean, that that was so creative just to think about that. I mean, as soon as you said the president, I mean, people are just going to like, what's this about? It's just it's, a, it's such a hook to pull people in, which I love. Right. That. Like, he seems to be in charge of something. He must, yeah. must be. Important. So when you thought of that, I mean, <laughs> was there was there different options? Like instead of president, was there different things, ideas you're running through? Like when did you guys lock into the president aspect? Well, well you know, it, it, it starts off. Every idea starts off as like a little seed and, and then they are sometimes um the right direction and sometimes you're like oh wait that's not it like there's something richer here because yeah. uh, i think at one point he was just going to be like we'll call it tiny obama and it's like, no <laughs> that's not what this is like this yeah. is not a mockery or mem- like it's not that it's yeah. a little leader like it's a little leader and then i just was like it's uh, my wife is the one who said kid president just call it kid president it's a kid president it's like yeah that's cool and then i started thinking about um Uh, all of the ways in which when a child is playing in their room, that is the center of the universe. And what if, uh, because I used to host a talk show in my bedroom. (laughs) This was like a talk show. I'm interviewing stuffed animals. I'm like, it it was, it was, um, uh, you know, I, I, if it had been broadcast to the world, who knows, who knows? (laughs) But what if you could broadcast a child's imagination yeah um and, and their deep desire to to the world in, in a way so we set up a, a little desk and the desk is actually a cool story because i found it on the side of the road one day uh and that's where i had the idea of ooh, that would make a great talk show host talk show desk uh and um i'd had that sitting around we had pieces of cardboard left over from camp uh giant sheets I was like, well, let's just make a little set. And I had tin cans from our cat. And and uh, so we made a tin can phone because, yeah, he wouldn't have a real phone. And uh, it had string and coming out of it. And, uh, yeah, just put him in his Easter suit and let's go. And, uh, <laughs> and so Robbie, who played the part of kid president, he is my brother-in-law. Uh, lives across the street from us or did until yesterday. Good grief, Jeff. Why are we talking? Oh. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, uh, we you know, I think I, I think I think about this. You are going to you're young enough to be able to enjoy seeing his future come together. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes, it, it's, it's a positive thing. You're going to you're going to just see him grow and his future grow and wherever it takes his path. And it's just you're part, a big part of that. Right. Uh, it's it's just it's hard. Uh, it's hard. It's like, oh. it, essentially, it's almost like your own kid going off to college. Right. It very much, very yeah. much yeah. so. Like the 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 journey he and I then went on, it, it, it's it's impossible to explain. And uh, there's a closeness that will always be there because, you know, we, we met President Obama and we went and sat in the Oval Office together. We slept. We had a sleepover at the National Archives and slept beside the Constitution of the United States That's of America. So, 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 so we, insane. We met Beyonce together. We interviewed celebrities like Tom Hanks and we, we had dance parties and, and uh, just that wild, journey. How wild, long, how long did journey. from, from he, he was nine at that time when it started to what age did we, did the actual, like the cutoff of those videos or when they did a slow start slowing down? Yeah, how many, so we, how many we, the journey? How long was the journey? Well, it's when it starts just us playing around, and I I said, Well, I've got enough to make more than one video. So I'll just with the scraps, I'll release one a week. And then I discovered accidentally one of the great secrets of making things on the internet that you know. It's consistency. Because <laughs> I had a million ideas before, but I've never been consistent. And uh, this one, I was like, okay, a little challenge. Um, one of my friends had actually told me this. He said, you are one of the most creative people I know, but I'm just waiting on you to actually stick with one of your ideas. And uh, that was Jeff Schanenberger. Shout out to Jeff, uh, who I hated at the moment when he said that. <laughs> But it was the kick in the pants I needed. It was him yeah. saying, hey, you got to like, just try this. Stick stick with an idea. Uh, so I released a video every week 
um, for uh, four years, maybe. Um, it was about four years. And then we began growing. We did a, a television series. We then moved into doing more different kinds of directing. Like I, I directed and wrote for Soul Pancake, which was Rain Wilson's production company and, and Friends. Yeah. Um, and, and moving into other television work where I was writing. And at that same time, like this project that I'd just been doing from my house and having fun with Robbie, um, it was still fun, but it was also becoming like a bit of a monster. Is uh, uh, you know, millions of people were watching, um, emails coming in, people assuming this fictional character was real, uh, assuming that this kid was making the videos himself and writing them and releasing yeah. them and not understanding the complexity of the message that I was trying to send about compassion and, yeah, yeah. and, and misunderstanding it. And so wanting to make him a celebrity, which he didn't want to be, or, or uh, like uh, it was this confusion around that, that we just wanted to make a thing that inspired and encouraged people and, and it did, but there were, it was just becoming a lot. And there was a moment where we were in LA and a, Robbie had uh, someone reach out wanting to know if he would like audition for a sitcom. And I thought, well, I don't think he would want to do this. He could, but let me ask him. And essentially the question was, do you want to try out for this sitcom or, you know, we'd stay in LA a couple more days. <laughs> He's like, or could we go home? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we could go home, but you know, this is a, you know, it'd be another a TV show. It's a pretty big deal. Um, He's like, but if I don't, we could go home. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. No, like, I don't care. We'll go home. He's like, I want to go home. <laughs> and and then, so I was like, okay, cool. Like, this is what he, he is much more interested in band and yeah. high school band or junior high band at that time. Yeah. And wanting to just be with friends. And uh, so I, I'm grateful that the rest of the family was supportive of this needs to be healthy. <laughs> like this needs to be uh uh the way it was it was birthed out of love and joy it should stay that way and it, it never got not that way uh but it could have easily veered into that territory yeah uh, and so thankfully we were surrounded by people at soul pancake and and other people in the industry which we miraculously found that actually cared about kids and said uh yeah we don't care if this continues to be a monster success we it doesn't succeed if the kid doesn't yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, you said exactly. You said you're surrounded around the right people to make the right decisions. Cause you always hear those horror stories where parents live vicariously through their children yes. and they would take that opportunity just to really, I mean, you you're, you could talk about, I mean, so many celebrities go down that path, young celebrities that were in the industry very early. Right. And, and it could have it could have gone both ways. I mean, he could have done the sitcom and became massive and loved it and had it been focused on a career. But at the same time, too, it could have turned to a negative. But uh, you have to always go with, I mean, your 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 intuition, your gut, right? So I'm happy you guys went that route. So one thing that was that was uh, one of the things that was um, beginning to happen. I mean, this sort of felt like it was the wild wild west days of YouTube in a way. Yeah, where everybody's still kind of figuring out what it is and how it works. And we were on the receiving end of a lot of of an audience that was still figuring out what YouTube was and began to almost want to transform it into something it wasn't, which was I just viewed the videos as like a little gift to everybody each week that they then could go do something good for other people Positive. or do whatever. And the industry began to see it as, oh, this is a media platform in which this child can help us advertise this or help us do this, yeah. or we can build a brand around it. And we're like, that's not what this is about. Yeah. <laughs> and there was even like a thing that was, uh, there's, there was a book that came out last year as a picture book. And it made me 
that's so sad because they were talking about kids who've done great things. And it was just all kids who've had a platform on YouTube. And I thought that's not like we were included in that. And I felt so weird about it. This isn't, kids who've done great things are, you know, your neighbors. Are kids do they, you do know. They, how did that work? Do they have to ask for authorization on something like that? Or they just I publish they it? Should. I don't I, know. I'm, I'm thinking, have. yeah, because they're using the lightning this, right? <laughs> this was, yeah. Well, I'm like, there's going to be kids in schools that receive the message that, you know, if you want to be special, you've got to do something big on YouTube. And that's not the message. But that, but, 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 but that's a message a lot of kids are getting, right? Yeah. I mean, social. we're living in, in, a, in a social media world where, I mean, TikTok. And I mean, I, I literally just got on TikTok two days ago because I'm like, I got to I got to utilize this platform for my podcast because everybody I am. I feel like I'm like last on the trying to jump on the ship there. But it's um, it's 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 crazy how I mean, you're getting some of these kids like YouTubers they are making millions. And they're like 16, yeah. 17. And it's it, it, it's just it's, it's, it's a, it could be a very powerful tool. And it could be a very negative tool. And with that negativity, was there ever moments where you're spreading positivity and you're just because there's a lot of trollers on social media? Were you ever getting any negativity towards any of your videos? Yes. That's see, that's the I hate that. And and you know, we I truly saw both sides of the yeah. internet because we were able to build a beautiful community that yeah. gave me so much hope in humanity, in, in possibility. It was people, I was like reminded, I'm not alone. There's other people who care. And there's all these people doing beautiful, like incredible human beings doing incredible things and just right where they are. And, you know, I would hear all that. And then because it was such a positive little bolt of light on the internet, like it also attracted people who just wanted to poke holes in, in it or to just troll and, um, and so we had uh, I, a, a fun opportunity there to to because we have this healthy community to have them be part of how to handle that in a in a positive way. Interesting. So especially because there's so many young people that were following it at the time. And we were able to like if somebody was attacking the page, then I would respond in the way that I try to respond in my own life, which is in a very human way where it would be a photo of me saying, hi, my name is Brad. I just read your comment. Like I'm a real person and it's okay if you don't like what I'm doing, but just wanted you to know I am a real guy and, and um, I hope that you have a good day. I see you. That was just a way to make it human. And yeah. we would also do where we're like, Hey, we hope you have a good day. Here's a corn dog. And it would be Robbie and I holding pictures of corn, do- holding corn dogs <laughs> and holding a sign that says that person's name. Like, and um, and what would happen? It would be co- begin a conversation, um, and uh, often those people would then converse with me. Would open up about you know they didn't really know what this was, or they would open up. They're like, "Oh, I, I'm sorry, I was having a bad day." But like they literally would say that. Um, not all the time, but it yeah. at least was a moment of humanity yeah. in this wild internet. And I think that's the secret. Um, it, it, it is a wild west, right? I mean, you're you're getting for every positive comment, you're you're always going to get your trollers. You're always going to get your uh, people just doing it. Not even they don't care. They're doing it for a reaction. Yeah. So how yeah. you react, your reaction to their reaction, like you said, turning it into a positive, really for one turns the light on to you because your positive influence is going to be seen by you the people that truly do care about you like hey this guy's legitimately a good person so i mean you guys nailed it on the head i mean exactly what to do right (laughs) and i made these stickers that i i I started as just a little project where i was putting it on i would draw on the newspaper the cover of the newspaper no matter who is on the front page i would put a little speech bubble coming out of them that said i'm just a human being who wants to be loved and no matter who was on the front page of the newspaper, sometimes it was hard for me to put that because it'd be like, oh, I really disagree with this person, just a human being who wants to be loved. And then I started sharing those. And um, and then I started realizing all the commenters, all those people, if I thought about them as 
this is just a human being who wants to be left. So maybe they're a troll. They just want to be seen. <laughs> or maybe they're being really sweet and they have something thought. It's, they're just a human being who wants to be left. And then think about them as a person with a heartbeat. As somebody who has a family, it's, just, it, but sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's hard, man. Some of those comments, it's hard sometimes. No, you, you, anybody, I, I said, whoever said you're your own worst critic never made anything for the internet. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Because everybody has these opinions, and that's one of the things when when kids ask me about, like, I want to start a YouTube channel. I want, I'm going to start doing TikTok. I'm going to start whatever. Um, one of the first questions I have for them is, well, what do you want to say? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what is it you want? What's your note you want to add to the symphony? Like, what, what is it? Um, is it that you just want to be seen? Um, that, that's a different conversation. Yeah. But if you really have something you want to say, I, I want to help you. Yeah. And, and let's start there. And that's where we really begin to create a better internet for each other when we treat it like a garden that we are tending and not the dumpster fire that it can become when we just add or pile on uh, or go to the shiniest, brightest thing. But if we try to nurture something good that we're wanting to say, and that's becoming, I think, increasingly harder. Uh, and I, I, I've had many days where I feel like I don't belong here. It's like, because it's become it's become such a big business, right? When you're getting celebrities, I mean, not even celebrities. I mean, these are just influencers. Like there's, I was talking to a couple of people that manage a couple of TikTok accounts and they have young quote unquote influencers. They're managing their accounts. And, and these guys don't have massive followings, maybe 500, 600,000 followers, which is still a big number, but mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're getting paid by companies 10,000, 15,000 to do a post. When mm -hmm. it becomes such a business, when you're dealing with a 16 year old getting $15,000 to do a post, now it's a huge industry. And when you yeah, turn right. into this massive industry, there's going to be jealousy, there's going to be competition, there's mm -hmm. going to be ways where people just, the negativity is just going to start flowing. And I don't think as it gets bigger, it's just going to get worse. Well, <laughs> That's one, one way to see it. And, and I feel that a lot, but I am in, I'm ever hopeful that this next generation can help us create something better uh, because we're in the middle of an attention war, <laughs> a yeah. war for people's attentions. Yeah. And what, what we also have are a whole bunch of people who maybe want attention or are hungry for it. Yeah. And what we need to do instead is pay attention <laughs> uh, to actually pay attention to uh, the rhythm of the world around us, to the heartbeats of those around us, to the things that are actually essential and vital. Uh, and that's becoming a little harder. It's getting drowned out in, in the, the noise and, and uh, all the bright lights. We're unable to see the natural light of the stars. Yeah, yeah. Unable to see. And, and so it is um, interesting that all these companies want to pay for the attention that uh, these uh, influencers can bring. Um, but it's also a reminder that this is an economy in which attention is, is, um, is valuable. And, and, and so I think hopefully more and more we can remind each other uh, that we, how worthy we are of each other's attention and how much it matters to pay attention to the things that actually matter. Yeah. And so I believe that if we actually nurture that, it can be a garden of good. No, I mean, there, there's a lot of people close to a dumpster fire. Yeah. hundred percent. There is a lot of people out there putting positive messages and a lot of people have the right mindset. So it's just, it's just exactly what you said. You, you just got to really hone in and who you're giving your time to because time is very valuable time is something we can't get back so look at who you're giving our time to and who mm -hmm. we're spreading mm -hmm. to there's one thing i saw on your social media uh socktober what, what what is that about is your involvement that did you start that what's that about yeah socktober was this idea that came from a kid um we had been doing different service projects here in our community in west tennessee and I mentioned 
to uh, this group of kids we were working with that, um, you know, just down the road from us is one of the largest per capita uh, populations of men and women who are homeless. And I just like stated that, you know, now I look at it and I'm, I'm mortified by this, but I stated it almost like it was a fun fact. Like I didn't say it in the hope that we could do something. I just said, yeah, did you know, like just down there, this, this, I just read that, huh? And then neat. And there was a, a girl who said, that's what we got to do something. How, like, how old, how old was she? Oh, uh, 15, yeah. maybe 15. It's just like, we, what? Uh, and I was struck by her immediate gut response was, I'm not okay with that. Like, we, what? It was not a fun fact for her. It was a hard fact that did not have to be so. Um, and so we began to, f- a journey of finding out what our neighbors who are homeless needed. And I realized I'd never visited our shelter. I realized I didn't know how many people, I didn't know anyone who was homeless. I did not know their names. I did not know their stories. And it was a journey of getting to know our neighborhood better and meeting these people who were showing up for them in a really meaningful way. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, I want to do something really big. I'm going to do something huge for the shelter. And she said, here's what we need. Socks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> socks they're one of the most needed least donated items it's about to get cold for winter that's what we need and i was a little like let down because i thought like let's do something big yeah. and uh then we said okay well and it happened to be close to fall so we declared the month of october socktober and began collecting just for that particular shelter and then the next year it, it went so well It was like an entry point to us doing more for the shelter, uh, finding out other needs they had. We thought, well, what could this look like in other communities? Uh, So we just declared it Socktober and let a few schools in on it. I made like a video and it was really, this was before Kid President. And uh, and we saw that there were schools and churches that started to do it in different parts of the country. uh, As just as they heard about it online or a friend had called them about it. And it was just people finding out what their local shelter needed and then rallying their community around that in the month of October. And then fast forward to kid president starting. And I had a did a kid president video where he declared it October and then it spread all over. Uh, And now, even now, years later, uh, like last year, it was mentioned on Jeopardy. (laughs) Like it was, uh, uh, it's become a thing that is, is, um people don't necessarily know where it came from or how there's no rewards there's no prize there's no central office you have to call to get permission it's literally just a reminder that hey there's people in need they're in your neighborhood go do it (laughs) and people do it and so october is this giant blast of hope to me it's a reminder that uh there is a lot of need but there's a whole lot of helpers and it's beautiful what we can do. Jeff, I was on an airplane one time and a dad asked me, um, so I'm like, what do you do? And I said, I make silly videos on the internet, you know? (laughs) And he's like, oh, that's cool. And I said, yeah, it's about kids and grownups making the world a better place. Usually that's the, the, the spirit of it. And then he said, oh, that's great. And he worked like at an office or did whatever. And he said, all right, let me show you a picture. This is me and my daughter's their school does this project. You probably want to check it out. It's called Socktober. <laughs> and and uh, we had never been to our shelter and he sent me a picture. He's, he's showing me on his phone on the plane. Uh, it's him uh, with his daughters and they're making him donate one of his jackets that they didn't like. And he's like, yeah, we went and, and yeah, but look it up. It's Socktober. And everything in me wanted to scream like I did that. It was me. I, <laughs> I made the website, like all that stuff. <laughs> But instead, I just, I was so struck. I was so struck by humble. like. I almost humbled, I would say. Just what? Yeah. How, how, how am I in the sky right now next to a person I've never met? He has, and that this is. It's, it's so, it's so. It, to do something. This is one of the positive things of the, the, our, our generation of the internet working. And, and it's just, the world is so small. 
And I, yeah. I would say the last two years because of COVID, I, I would say it's, it's sped up, sped up the technology where you're getting grandmas and grandpas now using Zoom and to talk to their grandkids. Like it's just it's sped up so much that has made us so much smaller of a world. And and yeah, things like yeah. that are going to be more. If we can remember more that, if we can things, remember the the things yeah. we do impact the people around us, the stories we tell create the world we live in. That that all this stuff we're connected far more than we could ever imagine, and and that it matters what you share and do, and and uh, you, I just it was this giant wink that yeah. hey hey keep going. It doesn't matter who gets the credit. <laughs> keep doing it. Um, storytelling. And this is also interesting. You have a passion for. Do you do you think it's almost becoming a, a slowly a lost art? Because it's like you, as growing up, you would have your grandparents, you would have yeah. people telling stories, sitting around, and now it's like you don't you don't get that experience anymore. Do you think it's slowly coming back through people like yourself, or is it something that oh, no, that slowly think, died out? Oh, no, I think that. Um, to tell a story is such a human thing. It's such a need that we have that from our earliest point in life, we hear the words once upon a time and our ears perk up and it doesn't stop. Yeah. Like um, and we tell stories all the time, whether we actually call it story time or not. Yeah. And, and they, they feed us, they nourish us. Yeah. I think the art that's being lost is the appreciation and respect of what stories can do. Uh, because stories nourish our imaginations. Like they, they began to furnish even our imaginations with things yeah. that, that we, we are only beginning to realize that the, the little things that we tell each other about who we are and where we live and what kind of meaning we make in our lives, those are stories. And, yeah. Yeah. and the stories we tell can create the world we live in. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 I want to tell stories in which everybody has a seat at the table. I want to tell stories in which everything can be okay and better and stories that push our imaginations to realize that that's possible. Stories where little kids are listened to behind the desk. Yeah. Stories where, where people are respected, where people are good to each other. That seems far from our imagination, but it should be right there in there and something we live out of. And so like, uh, I believe in the power of stories, um, and I can't wait to see what kinds of, uh, the thing that really excites me are generative stories, uh, and generative art, the kinds of things that we make that inspire other people to make things. Yeah. Um, I love the kinds of story that makes a kid go, Ooh, I want to do that. I want to tell that story. I want to do that. Yeah. Um, and so that's the kinds of picture books I'm wanting to make and the kinds of videos we do are the ones that I hope inspire more videos and the kinds that, you know, when we did kid president, it became a, uh, 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 a thing that I just, I couldn't believe was happening when I would tell a story about us throwing a parade for a postal worker. And then within a matter of weeks, there were hundreds of other parades being thrown in the country. <laughs> like, that's it's a story that inspires so, more stories. So powerful, huh? So powerful the influence that that was built there. Like, that, let's, 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 give me, give me one, give me, give me a little, a st give me a little story, a little story of meeting uh, President Obama. <laughs> What's funny is uh, Robbie and I this past summer uh, we spent a lot of time recording uh, a podcast of our own that that is. Um, I still don't know what I'm going to do, <laughs> how to do it. I may, I may need to talk to you, Jeff. Um, but I am getting to hear a lot of these things that we did together from his perspective. So I have my memory of going to the Oval Office and meeting President Obama. And then there's his memory, you know, <laughs> what it was like for him as a kid. So for me, it was this just magical thing where I went in and I was nervous wreck and I got to talk to him about what I was seeing in classrooms and all of this. And uh, I remember uh, one of the uh, secret service men was crying, like right as we were leaving. And he just said, this, this is really special. We haven't had something like this in a while. 
uh, because it was such a tender visit. Yeah. Uh, President Obama morphed from being leader of the free world to like friendly uncle who was asking him about his homework and pets and favorite colors and and then wanting to talk to me about what teachers needed and what I was seeing in schools and, and what kids needed right now and I got to like tell him that and that he actually was listening yeah and it was baffling and then Robbie's memory of that is the floor was really creaky <laughs> and like, and, and he remembers getting in trouble because he he got so nervous <laughs> when we were waiting to go in. He got so like, he was just this rambunctious kid. He didn't know what to do. So he started like putting his hands on the walls and I was going, don't touch the walls. Like you got oily <laughs> hands, like don't touch the walls. <laughs> then he started like, what if I lick the wall? And he started pretending he was going to lick the wall. And it was just <laughs> so strange. But one of the secret service guys came in and was like, Sir, please don't lick the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so he like remembers these weird little moments and, and also like remembers um, that he was given a, uh, you know, a yo-yo. The president gave him a yo-yo <laughs> at the presidential seal. Yeah. And um, it's just funny that, that, that those things were happening at the same time. <laughs> does, would, does Robbie have any inch in him future wise to go into politics no okay I, I just I, i'm sure you've been asked that a million times but i just had to ask no uh, and even as a kid it was never people would always ask that uh, yeah. or you know what he would want to do and it was it was always a different answer and it yeah, kept me on my toes like oh no what's he gonna say yeah <laughs> uh, so wh what current projects are you working on um, before we wrap this up? I just want to let the audience know what current projects you're working on and what things we can expect to see from you from the net and in your future. Yeah. So one thing I'm doing is an event called the Failabration. Uh, failabration. Okay. <laughs> failabration. It's like a celebration of failure. Uh, uh, I've, I've always gone to events where the speakers talk about all these cool things they've done and everybody's supposed to leave inspired. And I wanted to do one where everybody talked about their biggest screw ups and, and, uh, and everybody left going, Oh, okay. Well, Th I, those I, are, those are probably more of a lesson than anything else. Right. Totally. That's where the hope is. That's where the best <laughs> stories are. Like, I want to hear that. Tell me, tell me what didn't go right. You know? So we're doing an event called failabration that uh, I can't wait for. Um, and then um, I have a, a new book coming out called the fantastic bureau of imagination it's about a secret agency that uh, is um, uh, run by these little creatures called figments. And uh, very proud of that and excited to see um, what that sparks in the imagination of kids and former kids. Um, I love that picture books are this one form of media we have that is, uh, can be equally consumed and uh, appreciated by kids and adults. Yeah, yeah. The adults are reading it. Yeah. And uh, can be seen at different levels, and um, they, they're kind of uh, experienced by both people. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I'm really excited to see what this book means for kids and adults. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you one last question: If something were to happen to you today, how would you want to be remembered or described by your loved ones? Mm. <laughs> uh, dogs and kids loved him. <laughs> <laughs> do you have um, do you have a dog i don't i don't i grew up around dogs uh i love dogs we've been kind of you know we, we we've been uh uh campaigning for a dog at the house for a little bit but um we might get one um but there's something about the these uh dogs and kids they have an ability to see the best in people and um a true true character um and so i would hope i i, I am loved un un unconditional love right unconditional the highest honor un 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 kids and dogs. unconditional love we have we have a uh, we have a i mean we have our, our three-year-old uh chocolate uh, lab and he's just a bundle of love right and this doesn't there's there's nothing that spells love like a dog like you just walk in the house and that 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 enjoyment of just like that 
he's home, he's home, wagging his tail. There's yes. nothing like that. Nothing Wag like of the that. tail, the perk of the ears. All I, I, I'm going to show you something. Um, when my dad passed away, I wanted something to keep his memory going, and I think you'd appreciate this. And um, I took pen to paper, and I actually, um, within a seven-day period, I wrote um, six children's books. I only released two of them so far. And it, it was nothing to do with the money. It had to do with just keeping his memory alive. And they're called Adventures of Grandpa Joe. And in the books, there is my grandfather and my my, uh, my dad and his two, and my my two kids. And they look identical to them and everything. It's just adventures with a lesson. And the oh, first right. and the first one that came out was you can see this here, Strawberry Mountain, a lesson a lesson on gratitude. And this <laughs> and this and the second one is Kindness Goes a Long Way. Adventures oh. of Grandpa Joe. Oh, that's good. What a gift. So I, 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 I thought you would appreciate that more than most people, but it's just, uh, I think it's just, it's just a way of, for the future, for people to, especially my kids to really, really have something to hold on to for uh, memories with, uh, with their, uh, their grandpa. Yes. To keep telling the stories. Yeah. Yeah. Body them and live yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. This has been amazing, brother. Uh, I, I totally love this. I'd love to have you back on. I'm sure that you're constantly doing different things that we could probably talk all the time. So I'm sure I'll have you back on. And I'm looking forward to you finally releasing those podcasts. <laughs> if you need help, you know where to come and ask. Yeah, I, I do need help. I, I'm figuring it's, it's learning a lot. Uh, yeah. But I appreciate and love what you're doing and, and what you're building, um, not just with the podcast, but with your life. So no, bravo, my that. friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.